We left off this morning looking at a lesson that addresses the specific area of growth in regards to our service to the Heavenly Father. And in this lesson this morning, we began by showing several Old Testament examples of individuals of the Israelites and so forth serving God. And this was God's expectation of the people. Then we showed that even under the new covenant, there's still the idea of us serving God. So much so that we established that we are all servants of God. Every person that has obeyed the gospel's call into salvation is a servant of God and therefore should serve God. God bought them with the price of Jesus Christ's blood upon the cross of Calvary. He purchased us, redeemed us, bought us back, if you would, and made us holy so that we might be able to serve him. Um, I was always struck by Joshua's warning to the, ch to the children of Israel. If they allowed themselves to go after false gods, they would no longer be holy and they could not serve God. They would have no right to go before him in service. They had to be holy. They had to be consecrated before God. The same thing is expected of us today. When you became a Christian, when you obeyed the gospel's call into salvation, you were made holy so that you might serve the Heavenly Father. But tonight we're going to continue in this idea of growing in our service unto God by talking about the necessary attitudes that a servant would have, a servant that respects, the servant that, that is serving God. And the first thing that we're going to start with it needs to have the attitude of love for the Lord, love for the master. Here he sent his son, God sent his son to die upon the cross of Calvary. As we said, paid the price for our sins, bought us back, redeemed us. The whole concept of the scheme of redemption. God has saved us from eternity in torment. We should love him for all that he has done for us. When Jesus was asked which was the greatest of the commands in Mark chapter 12, verses 29 through 30, he told them that they, the greatest of the command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first, this is the greatest of the commandments. And we understand that when we step back and we give thought to all that is taught within the scriptures, and what God expects of us, we cannot have the proper service if we don't have the proper love for him. Therein lies the motivation. Therein lies that which propels us to serve him in a means that is pleasing in his sight. Turn over to John chapter 14 for just a moment. Notice what Jesus says to his disciples here in John chapter 14. And let's start our reading there in verse 23. And we're going to Read this down through verse 30. John chapter 14, beginning of verse 23, he says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. Is it possible to obey the Lord without properly loving the Lord? Yeah, that's possible. You could do the right things for the wrong reasons, but that doesn't get you into heaven. It's the obedience that comes from loving our Lord and our Savior. Notice there beginning in verse 25, these things, he says, these things I've spoken to you while being present with you. And he goes and promises to them about the helper, the Holy Spirit who would come. And he would, a peace that he would leave with them. And he continues there within this context telling them what he's going to do for them. But their obedience hangs upon their understanding that if they're going to truly obey the Lord, it has to begin with love for the Lord. A love that is based upon what he has done for us, a recognition of what he has made possible for us. A lot of people profess a belief in Jesus, but do they truly love him? A lot of people profess an acknowledgement, and some will even say they love him. But love is proven by the things that we do. Love is proven by what exists within our heart. 
And a true love for the Lord, yes, will yield obedience. A true love for God will yield a servant that's going to follow him no matter what. And it, the second thing, the second attitude that we need to have as far as servants, is we need to have respect. We need to have respect not just for God, but for the Word of God. When the Lord speaks, we listen. When the Lord's Word lays down a pattern or lays down a command or tells us what not to do, we respect Him. He's our master. He's telling us what we should be doing. Notice here a couple of passages. Let's begin there with John chapter 13 or John chapter 12. Jesus, when he came, notice he says here in John 12 verse 48, he says that he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him, he says. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say, what I should speak, and I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. In our Sunday morning class, we're studying through John. We find that if we reject Jesus, then we reject God. If we reject what Jesus taught, we reject the Father. But if we listen to what Jesus teaches, then we're listening to the Father, we're listening to our master because he sent his son. <clears throat> and Jesus taught what his father would have him to teach. This is why 2, Thess or 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 is so encouraging. Because here, having, after having acknowledged how that Timothy was made wise unto salvation through the Holy Scriptures, Paul goes on and reminds us that all Scripture has been breathed out by God. All scripture has been given by the inspiration of God. Everything our master wants us to know, he has told us. Everything that we need to be prepared, he has given to us. He said everything that we ha he's given is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped, thoroughly furnished to every good work. Someone says, how do I serve God? You study his scriptures. You listen to what he has to say. You live your life by that standard. It is a respect that we see for the word of the Lord. We see it often within the life of David himself. Notice with me over in Psalms 119. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Psalm 119. Psalms 119. And let's start our reading there in verse 9 and read down through verse 16. Notice the respect that is seen within David's writing for the word of God. He says, beginning in Psalms 119, verse 9, How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your heart I have hidden in my heart, or your word I have hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I'll meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I'll delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. This was David's attitude regarding the word of God. And this should be our attitude as well. This should be our respect. He is our master. He is saved us from our sins. He's paid the price, Christ's blood, and bought us out of that slavery unto sin. And he's told us how we are to live. Let us respect that and then submit ourselves unto the Lord. That's the third attitude. There's got to be a full submission. When we talk about converting someone to Christ, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about sitting down with them with the word of God. And we began to talk to them about all that God has done. Talk to them about sin. Talk to them about the danger sin puts us in. Talks to them. We talked to them what Christ, what God sent Christ to do. And what is now made possible by the blood of Christ. What we're trying to do when we try to convert someone to Christ is to get them to the point to where they realize, they, they realize that they want God as their master that they want God to be the one that leads them in this life. 
and to get to the point to where they're willing to submit themselves unto his will. You know, an individual is not going to willingly submit unto anything God's taught unless they have been convicted by the word, unless they are convinced that he is the one that they need to submit to. I mean, we kind of mentioned this briefly in passing this morning, but there are a lot of different religious beliefs, a lot of different gods in the world that people worship. And there's always going to be somebody who can talk somebody into submitting unto them. Look at all the cults. Look at all the, 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 the situations where men have led people to their deaths. Because somehow or another, this, this person right here was able to convince these people that he was worth following. They ended up submitting unto him to the wrong person, sadly. When we study with people from the Word of God, it's not about getting them to submit to our will and our understanding. It's trying to get them to submit to God and to what His Word has to say. This submission is what brings obedience to His will. James makes the point in James chapter 4, verse 7, regarding the importance of submission. And by the way, once you become a Christian, there's still the need to live your life in full submission to God. In James chapter 4, verse 7, he says, therefore submit to God. He says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But resist to, or submit unto the heavenly Father. Notice another passage that very well illustrates this submission. We're going to turn to Luke chapter 17, verses 7 through 10. You know, this passage would have to come up at some point in the lesson talking about serving the Lord. Luke chapter 17, let's start our reading there in verse 7, and we'll read through verse 10. Here's what Jesus says. And which of you, having a servant, plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat? But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank that serpent because he did the things that were commanded him? He says, I think not. So likewise, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. The message here isn't about the, the master, the message is about the servant and the proper disposition that is to be had by the servant. Recognizing that in service to God, there's no point that we can ever reach within our life where we say, I deserve it. He's our master. He bought us with the blood of Christ. Our bodies are his. And therefore, whatever we do in service unto God... We are thankful to him, but whatever we do, we never have the right to pat ourselves on the back and say, well, I've now earned my path to heaven. The best we can say is we've done what was expected of us as unprofitable servants. We're serving our heavenly father. We cannot help but to do anything else. We are going to serve him, submit unto his will. That's the point of Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Who will enter into the kingdom of heaven? Well, he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. There, God, there will be a lot of people say, Lord, look at all the great things that we did. And people do a lot of great things. But if they don't submit unto the master as servants, if they don't do his will, then it brings them nothing and they will end up departing the day of judgment. So recognize that it is so important that we have the attitude, the spirit of submission and that we desire to please our Lord. He's our master. He has bought us back out of our bondage unto sin. We are his servants. We should want to please him. We should want to live our lives in a way that he will be pleased, not disappointed in us. Turn with me to Luke chapter 15 for just a moment. Notice what happens when an individual becomes one of God's children. When they obey, as we call it, and Paul references the gospel, you know, the call unto salvation, the gospel's call. Notice what happens in heaven when a sinner repents. 
Luke chapter 15, beginning there in verse 4. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. What we find here is that when an individual becomes a child of God, even when a Christian who has walked away is restored back into fellowship, there's joy in heaven. Now, don't we want to cause joy in heaven, if you would? Don't we want to cause, to cause God pleasure, to have him to be pleased with us? It's like a little child seeks the parent's approval, think, seeks the parent's uh, praise and adoration, and, and that they do something that in their mind is the greatest drawing they've ever drawn. And it's just two sticks on a piece of paper. And as a parent, you don't say, you need to do better than that. You know, now, if they're 21, then you might want to do that. But, you know, you say, that's beautiful. That's the best two lines I've ever seen. And then they say, no, that's a duck. Well, that's the best duck I've ever seen. And you hang it on your refrigerator. Your children want your admiration. They want you to be pleased with them. That's the way we should be with God. We seek him to be pleased. We seek to, to please him, I should say. Matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please him. All right? We must believe that God is and that God is rewarded of those who diligently seek him. It is that type of servant with whom the Lord is pleased. Over in Paul's letter to the church at Rome, note with me in Romans chapter 8, there in verses 5 through 8. Paul talks about striving to be spiritually minded. This is how we please God. Romans chapter 8, let's start there in verse 5. He says, for those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on things of the flesh. Romans 8 verse 5. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh, notice the last three words there, cannot please God. We must be seeking to follow after the Spirit, to serve God, to put Him above all else. This is how we find ourselves pleasing the Heavenly Father. And then the last attitude that we're going to talk about before we move on is as a servant, you have to be faithful to the master. If you have a servant that is untrustworthy, an untrustworthy servant is worthless. Okay? You know, you think about Abraham trusting uh, his son Isaac to his servant to go find a bride for his servant. Think about the, Ab the trust that Abraham had to have in that servant to go and properly represent him and going back to his family to find the bride for Isaac. A servant must be trustworthy. And God must be able to trust us to serve him, to be good stewards, if you would. Notice with me in Luke chapter 12, verses 42 through 48. Jesus here in Luke chapter 12. Notice what he says there. We'll start our reading in verse 42. He says there, beginning in verse 42, who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them the portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants to eat and to drink and to be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware and will cast him in, in, cast him in two and point, cut him in two 
and point and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But you who do not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. And, and he continues to the, the point in the illustration that we're going to, we're going to pull from this is that of the comparison between the master and the faithful servant. God expects us, God desires us to be trustworthy, to abide by his word, to take that which he has appointed to us and live accordingly. We could talk about the parable of the talents if you wanted to. How that the master entrusted into the servants <clears throat> the money they're to work with. Well, God has entrusted a responsibility, his will, He's entrusted it to us for us to abide by and for us to follow. And so we've got to be the faithful servant. We've got to be the one who is preparing for the master's return and not the one who's going to be caught off guard when the master returns. That's just a number of five attitudes, I think, that's required of a faithful servant. So now here's the big question. In what ways do we serve the Lord? Yeah. In what ways do we serve the Lord? And this was really the kind of the question that started the research in the beginning to develop this lesson. You know, first off, do we actually serve the Lord? And the answer was, yes, we do. Well, how do we serve the Lord? Well, I go to church every now and then. There, there, maybe that's serving the Lord. Or, you know, every now and then I, I'll help someone that's in need. Maybe that's serving the Lord. What exactly, in what ways do we serve the Lord? Well, there are three different things we're going to talk about here real briefly. The first one is this. When we come together at any point, when we praise and worship him, we are serving him. Children of Israel, God told Pharaoh he wanted his people to be let, let them go so they might go into the wilderness and serve him. They not only would serve him, they would end up worshiping him. And they would abide by his commands. This was his desire for them. Well, for us, do we not, when we come together in this capacity, offer up praise and adoration for our Heavenly Father? This is part of how we serve Him, by worshiping Him, by offering up this worship. John chapter 4, verse 23 through 24, you know, Jesus tells the woman at the well that a time was coming, and now is, when the Lord would seek those who would worship Him in spirit and in truth. Those individuals, you know, no longer do you have to go to Jerusalem to worship. No longer did you worship on Mount Gerizim, which was the understanding of the Samaritans. But a time was coming and now is when whoever worshiped God would worship him in spirit and in truth. For the Lord is seeking such to worship him. And that's what we do. And it's not simply about saying, okay, I've, I've checked into services four hours for the week, so I'm good to go. That's just part of what we do. It is part of our service unto God. But yet there's so much more. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, you'll see the phrase there where they offer the sacrifice of praise to God with the fruit of their lips. When we are living in the world and we talk to people of the world, we're letting our light shine before men. Do we speak well of the Lord? Do we speak favorably of the Lord? Do we bless his name? Do we praise him to others? Do we talk about his marvelous graciousness? with which he has so mercifully graced us with. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, we see there within the text. This is the life that we live, a life of worship, a life of praise. Matter of fact, when you think about Hebrews 5, 19 through 20, it is the idea of making a melody within your heart to the Lord. When we speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Yes, we serve God when we worship Him. Yes, we serve the Lord when we praise Him. When we bring the fruit of our lips and we reverence Him in holy adoration. He is a holy God. He is set apart. We have been set apart from our sins so that we might worship Him. But we also find that we serve the Lord through offering sacrifices. Now, I'll tell you, I am extremely thankful that we don't live dear, under the Mosaic law. One, we're not in Jerusalem, so we wouldn't have to offer sacrifices. But can you imagine what that would entail in this day and age? How many permits you'd have to get? 
And then you got the whole people who love animals a whole lot. So they would object to that. Actually, what would happen at some point, and, and this, this has happened, in the religious belief that used to offer animal sacrifices, knowing that they can no longer offer animal sacrifices, the sacrifices now that they view are more spiritual. It's interesting how the doctrine's kind of reshaped itself through the years. But we do offer sacrifices. Matter of fact, if you turn over to Romans chapter 12, here's probably the greatest sacrifice that we could possibly offer. Jesus made the greatest sacrifice when he, when he died for our sins, but Paul says in Romans 12, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He's calling for us to present our whole body as a living sacrifice unto God. He's our master. He's our Lord. We're his servant. Our bodies belong to him. We belong to him. This is the proper mindset of one who is seeking to serve the Lord. Our whole life is a sacrifice to him. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, we are to continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, the Hebrew writer says. It's the idea of living our lives in such a way that we're always giving unto the Heavenly Father that from our life which we can. And we'll elaborate here a little bit more on maybe how this is done in just a moment. But this is, it is the sacrifice that we're talking about. Turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 25, verses 26 and 27. We have in Luke chapter 25, and let's start our reading there in verse... <clears throat> verse 26. And... Um, You know, if you find Luke 25 before me, raise your hand. <laughs> Got to go to my outline real quick. Yeah, it's not supposed to be there at all. <laughs> Turn with me, if you would, for just a moment to, um, oh, I don't know what I meant by that. I meant something by that, and it was really good. It's probably the best point of the whole sermon. Anyway, <laughs> all right, it's better to catch these things before the lesson than right during the middle of it. But let's go on to the next one, though. Yes, we're to love the Lord, all right? And, oh, Mark, that's not even Luke 25. Uh, but remember the reference we said in Mark chapter 12, we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Maybe that's what I intended right here. The point that we're talking about is, I got it, I remember it now. That's the wrong passage quite clearly, wrong passage. This is what was supposed to have been here. Jesus makes the point, and yes, it has to do with loving him. And this is what it relates to, the sacrifice part. That we're supposed to hate our family, and love the Lord. Okay, so when you find that, you'll find one of those numbers are right. One of those numbers is going to be right there. Um, but the point there is that the sacrifice that we make is where we love him above all else. And that's the point. Okay, the point that he's making in the proper passage there is that we cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. We cannot love the Lord unless we're willing to hate our mother, hate our father, hate our families, unless we're willing to hate the world. That's the sacrifice that we're supposed to make. And so what we need to do is to make certain that within our lives as Christians that we love the Lord above all else. And, and normally it's not a conflict until you reach that one point in your life where what God wants you to do is in stark contrast to what your family wants you to do. Then that's where the sacrifice comes in. You choose to follow the Lord. Is the sacrifice of your life always seeking the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 6, 33. So let's continue now to the last point of how we serve God. We've already talked about, let's back up one more chart. We serve him through praise and worship. We serve our heavenly father through offering the sacrifices of our life to him. And the last one's real simple. Like the children of Israel, they serve the Lord through obeying him. It's that simple through a continual obedience unto God. I've made this point a couple of times already, both this morning and tonight, 
that our life as Christians, our life as servants of God, is much more than the, the, the handful of times we come together during a week to worship Him. It's much more than the, the times when we kneel or we bow down to pray unto Him. It is the entirety of our life. Times that we might think to be so insignificant at work or at school or at recreation. Times when we have to make even what would appear to be the most insignificant decisions. When we make decisions based on the word of the Lord, then we're serving him. If we choose to, to obey a command that he's given us, then we are serving the Lord. If we choose not to sin, then we make that decision because we are servants of the Lord. So that we can have a correction and everything where it needs to be. That passage that was, I had intended us for, to go to was going to be Luke chapter 14, verses 26 and 27. Now how 14 came 25, I don't know. But mark that if you're taking notes. It's Luke 14, verses 26 and 27 there for them. But do you understand the point that we're making here through the continual obedience? It's every day of our life. You know, if there's some time that we do something that we know that is wrong, we're not being a servant of God. If, if we know that there's something that we should be doing, an opportunity to do good for somebody, an opportunity not to engage in sin, an opportunity to sit down and just spend the day with our family and be the Christian we're supposed to be. This is how we serve God. It's continual obedience under his will. This is what he wanted children of Israel to do. You know, you think about it. We don't know a lot about them. We, we know some, but, but what about the Tuesday that took place three months after David's inauguration? Well, what did the Israelites do on that Tuesday? I don't know. They lived their lives like we live our lives, but they lived in obedience unto God. And that's what we do. And so what we're talking about here in, in, in living our lives as serving God, as servants of God, and growing in our service unto God, what we have to do is ask ourselves, are we truly growing in this service unto God? You know, look back. How long have you been a Christian? Think about the number of years or the number of days, the number of weeks or months, however long. And how, I guess we might say, how has your persistence been? How has it grown in insisting upon doing what is right, insisting upon serving God, insisting upon choosing not to do this but to do this because as a servant of God, that's the only choice you can make. Are we living our lives as servants who have been bought with the price? Are we living our lives holy and set apart from the sin of the world? This is how we need to grow as servants of God. Now, if you're not a Christian, you need to become one. We've already shared with you the primary reasons why Christ came and died upon the cross of Calvary. And if you're currently lost in your sins, all those sins can be washed away by the blood of the Lamb. If you believe that Christ is the Son of God and make the repentant change of heart and confess, his, confess your belief before those who are present, if you do that, then we'll baptize you. The Lord will add you to the church, not this congregation, but the body of Christ. You'll be added to the body of Christ by God, rising up to walk in the newness of life. Then live faithfully unto death as a servant of God. If you are a Christian, you've not been living faithfully. You hear this every Sunday, don't you? I probably need to change up the way I close the sermons. But if you are a Christian, you've not been living faithfully. Why? What is it in your life? What master has attracted you away from God? What is it? Identify it. Turn away from it. Turn back to God in humble repentance and be restored to his fellowship. Maybe you need the prayers of the congregation. We can help you with that. If you're ready to become a Christian, we can help you there too. If you come forward as we stand and as we sing.